Okay, how are you? We made it. We made it. Rabbi Sachs uh, is, uh, well, I think he turned out, but yeah, he's a gentleman that's known across, really probably across most of, of uh, the Western world over in the United States and Europe, and uh, has written a number of books. And this is one that he wrote in its entire morality. And uh, it's a, sort of a, if you would, an investigation and exploration into uh, the question of what our state of morality is in the Western world, in particular the UK and, and, and specifically the United States. And he works and starts from a uh, kind of very specific point of view and, and hopefully we'll be able to make some sense of why we're uh, spending a little time talking about things that might quote, quote, appear to be religious. But uh, fundamentally what Rabbi Sachs states is that he believes that a free liberal democracy must have a strong moral base. And without that strong moral base, it is in great danger. And this would be true in any country, he thinks, throughout history that is, has been proven to be the case. And uh, therefore, we have to look pretty carefully at what is going on in our society and what our moral state is. And it is it his belief is that uh, if we can use this term, we accumulated a lot of moral capital early on in the founding of this country. And it carried on for quite some time. We have ups and downs in terms of how our behavior patterns as a culture uh, function, but nonetheless, a fairly decent moral society. But his perception is that in the course of the last 60 to 70 years, we have entered into a period in which we have had a slide in morality. And it is his general belief that the essential element of why this would be occurring is that we have moved from a we-oriented society to an I-oriented society. That preoccupation with self, with one's own concerns, with a fairly limited worldview has led us to the position at which we're in today. Well, to get to maybe try to link these two together, sort of our secular religion and our religious religion, we have to kind of take a couple of journeys back, try to here. And believe me, these are surveys and not in-depth kind of perspectives. We don't have time and probably don't have enough knowledge. But uh, I want to start off with reading, just very briefly, from our secular Bible, which is the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. This is from the Declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable, unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, we all are familiar with that. We've heard that many, many times. But the next paragraph also has significance for us. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. Now that is kind of the view on which we came together. This is a concept that had developed over the 17th century and 18th century, and it was, a, I think, Locke was the philosopher and so forth. And, and, and the theory was this. The human beings had to gather together in groups, and they had to say these certain elements are important and significant and that we will have to agree to abide by these rules as a group. Now, they differentiate. What Jefferson has stated in his statement, there are certain unalienable rights. <coughs> unalienable rights is there just in any negotiating room on those. Those are built in, inherent in place, and we have to, we have to continue to look at those and not those. And then he says, among those, not all, but among those are life, liberty, 
and the pursuit of happiness. Now, we all like the sound of that, and as a culture and as a nation, we go along with that. But then on the other side, we have alienable rights. And alienable rights are those rights that we possess, but that we determine for the good of society, for the ordering, for well-being, and so forth, we give up certain freedoms in order to observe these. For example, maybe one or two real quick ones. Really? The fact that I can't go 75 miles an hour down Harvard Avenue, I've given up my freedom. I don't have that freedom to do that, really, unless I'm willing to pay probably a very, very heavy fine, lose my license, and so forth. I can't declare myself a heart doctor without certain justifications and confirmations from the state in terms of education, training, and so forth. So alienable rights are those rights that we give up in order to create a reasonably orderly society. And they are uh, very negotiable. Over the course of time, they change from place to place. I do not want to suggest that there are always, we have complete agreement about those alienable rights, and we don't have complete agreement, it doesn't seem anymore, about unalienable rights either. But those at least are two things to understand as we look at the overall system and the overall situation of our society. But those are, those are the concepts that emerged. It was necessary to do this in order to have a functioning society that I didn't impose upon or create, live with fear on myself. My neighbors didn't live with fear, anger, and so forth. It was an essential element for us to succeed as a nation. Rabbi Sachs next presents a general observation that hopefully relates in time. And he said we are at a unique moment once again in history. One that these don't occur very often, but that the emergence of the technological society is an event in history, in his judgment, that perhaps is most comparable in terms of its impact and change on us to the development of the printing press. That at up to this point in time, from that point up to roughly the last 25 to 30 years, we lived within a certain general framework. Not that things didn't change, but it was a certain overall general framework we worked in. His thesis is that that general framework has now changed. We have, uh, as one pundit said, uh, capacity for information to be disseminated with amazing rapidity. One person made a statement said, a lie will circle the globe while the truth is tying its shoes. And I think there is beneath that a lot of significance, how quickly information can be disseminated. And the difficult thing that I think certainly does exist, nothing new in it, is that it is almost impossible to discern what is true. Almost impossible to discern what is true. So we have some struggles ahead of that. This unique moment <coughs> creates stress on governments and on societies. The democratic process that the United States developed in the Western, many of the Western countries evolved was an event that occurred primarily involved in the 1700s. And that is a completely different world than we live in today. Things moved at an infinitely slower pace. And there could be debate and discussion and determination and so forth. We live in the instantaneous response and society that expects matters to be resolved very quickly. And it is putting immense stress upon our country and at others around the Western European nations. So we have this we have this challenge facing us. And the question is, 
what are, the, what are sort of the effects that we're seeing now? And Rabbi Sachs didn't write the book just simply to say that things are great and we're just smoothly cruising along. He thinks there are a number of areas right now that if we don't recognize, acknowledge, and deal with, we stand a great chance of, of losing those freedoms we have. Now, again, I want to emphasize that as we talk about these two things, Rabbi Sachs views the free liberal society as a moral choice. A moral achievement is a better word on that. Uh, three things, real quickly, he says. We have two elements that fundamentally control the operation of most societies, certainly the one which we live in today. One is the, the marketplace, the economy. That determines very much of what we see, do, and decide. And then we also have the state, the governmental powers. Both of those two, in his view, is are fundamentally items that can function reasonably well, but they simply will not function well for a society as a whole if the third element of morality is not interjected in it to ameliorate the excesses of both of them. We certainly know the markets can be cruel to lots of people. That's been proven time and again. The economy can collapse and hundreds of thousands and millions of people can be out of work. We certainly know that the state can step into matters and create immense amount of problems and certainly it can also create certain policy responses. But that point of view then is that we have to have, if we are to be a successful ongoing society, the element of morality as the integral part of our public life and without it, the I oriented society will not survive. He says there is not, in his judgment, evidence anywhere that a society that becomes totally preoccupied with itself and its, member, its own individual members will succeed. Okay, the matter of concern that we'll talk about real quickly here. One of them that's probably particularly on the difficult for us is we talk about the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, let's real quickly touch bases. The concept of happiness has changed a good bit over the course of time. And I'd like to maybe give permission just to kind of read a little bit here. Happiness traditionally, and I want to say traditionally, happiness as defined at the time that the Declaration of Independence was written, would have been an activity of the soul. Live in accordance with virtue, living temperately, courageously, and wisely. That would be the definition. If I'm going to be a happy person, this, these would be the elements of what would compromise that happiness. Happiness today, Divine as the products, services, and experiences that we can buy. <laughs> Happiness has moved from a state of being and doing, and that is receiving the happiness that occurs from being a constructive member of society, responding to needs, and so forth. Within that society, it's moved from a state of being and doing to a state of feeling and the pursuit of pleasure. I have been guilty many times, and I'm in our family, perhaps you've done so forth, when I asked talking about your kids, you say, I just want my children to be happy. What do we mean by that? Do we mean one? Just have them have the first description or the second description. We have to realize, finally, that the consumer society in which we live today really it's essentially is structured to create discontent. Think about that for a moment. We are constantly the recipient 
of advertising that suggests if we will take this action, in other words, if my car has 67 different things I don't know how to do instead of 30, <laughs> I will be happy. If I make the most elaborate trip around the world, I will be happy. That if I don't somehow, well, you know, I, I, I should really be looking at it and be uh, uh, concerned about it. So we have a society that in which happiness, which is listed as a part of the very early part of Jefferson's Declaration. We have then, secondly, according to Rabbi Sachs, uh, a situation where the question of our democracy is under greater stress than it has been for a long, long time. Uh, there's been a lot of comment talk about this. Uh, many, many persons I think that we are in the most difficult position that we've been in so, since the uh, Civil War, the period before the Civil War in terms of, of discontent. A lot of this is related, I think, to the question of rights. We hear that word a lot. And that uh, in terms of understanding our democracy and how we function and so forth, uh, you oftentimes hear why this person's right to have that, and this person's rights to have that, this or that. I, again, referring back, because this doesn't necessarily mean right just to understand fully or try to understand the best we can the question of what uh, rights are. We talked about alienable, alienable and unalienable rights. That rights were fundamentally determined at the outset of the formation of this country to be those items that were developed that were protection of the citizen from the state. In other words, it wasn't that you were entitled to this. This was to make sure that the state was not infringing upon your life, your liberty, and so forth. It was a little bit of differentiation. Now, today, we live in quite a bit of a different concept of rights when you think about it. These are today, to, to a great degree, demands upon the state. I insist it is my right to have medical care from the time I'm born until the time I die. That is not just an option, a desire, a goal of society. It is a right. I have the right to be sure that my children are treated fairly, that nobody can create any difficulties for them in the classroom, etc. We can go on and on with the perceptions of what rights are perceived to be, but they are fundamentally demands upon the government in both cases, in which you are expected, that government is expected to ensure that your particular situation is not subject to any kind of risk or damage. So, we have a rights-oriented society, which is a point of concern when carried, when viewed as demands upon the social structure. We have what Rabbi Sachs believes is a very, very significant problem. It's interesting that he is deeply concerned with the question of what we call identity politics. We all heard that term a hundred times in the world today. And he states on this that he wants to make very clear to his readers that to be concerned about identity politics is not to say there are not legitimate concerns and problems and so forth that individual groups have had in this country. We would certainly all recognize that it has been the case that there have been great inequities. But it is his belief that the process that we valued and the process we think led to the success of this country was essentially the elevation of the individual, the opportunity and the rights of the individual. And individually, you can work with others, certainly, and you can uh, 
it proves together to achieve, but you do not make the claim, as the rabbi sees it, that simply being a member of a group entitles you to certain specific privileged situations and the society has to respond to you because you are a part of that identity and that the accompanying element that has gone with that to a great degree has been that it's very hard to understand what that particular group's problems and challenges are. We, we hear that quite often, you know, you, you really can't understand because you're not X, you're not A, or whatever, whatever the particular situation would be. What he perceives that to be is rather than bringing people as a whole into an interrelated society in which we respond one to the other and look at the value of what we're all trying to do, that this creates, in essence, sort of a barrier around groups in which if you're a part of this group, then you're entitled to have certain complaints that are going to automatically be listened and that you've been mistreated if you're a part of it, and no one else can understand it, and therefore, how do we solve the problem? And that becomes a mess of difficult, how we solve the problem on that. The next area that he talks about of concern is, and, and kind of some interesting statistics, I think, here, if you'll forgive me for reading these, but uh, in 1956, 75% of the person people surveyed felt that government as a whole did the right thing. And you can remember back, all of us get back to that age and so forth. We had a great deal of confidence by and large. We thought it very, very surprising if something would come up of uh, acts that we didn't think. That figure had declined by 2017 to 17%. <laughs> A staggering loss, really, in terms of that, and it's, and with that, we look at kind of the specifics of who and, and why. We're sort of one group that kind of had a long-term sense of confidence in the in the general well-being of the government, but there's no question that our younger generations have some different attitudes on that. Uh, Said so one third of the population of the millennial survey did not feel that civil rights was an essential element within our society. 25% felt that free elections are not essential. 16% in 1996 thought that democracy was not necessarily the best system in which people could be governed and operated. <coughs> And that figure moved to 25% by 2011. There's that much fundamental questioning, if you could use that terminology, about uh, this. Now, what Rabbi Frank Sen says is that, uh, and this is really a, a, a real difficult task, I think, to deal with. We have if you could use the terminology, subjectified truth. We have a hard time believing that a statement is true. We immediately, when the statement is made, we start saying, oh, this person was owned by this group over here or only reflects this attitude. And uh, you know, we, we just have a great deal of problem uh, Believing many things are true, and part of it, as I alluded to earlier, was the internet has constant assault of information with no way of verification of whether it is true or not true. But if we cannot believe in fundamental truth going on, we are in serious trouble as the rabbi sees it. Because if you don't have truth, and a society in which you can believe in, 
then you cannot have trust. And if you don't trust anything, if you don't trust your government, your mayor, whatever it may be, whatever direction you come from, it is very difficult to imagine a society working effectively. So these are two, two really large issues that come up and, and they create, again, real stress. We realize, and, and I, I think it is a fair statement to make, that we are constantly barraged by media trying to reflect a certain point of view on us that doesn't encourage any discussion back and forth about issues that matter because it is more profitable, if you could use that terminology, to create dissatisfaction, insist that the other side is doing all bad things and that we have to kind of get even with them, if you could use that terminology. It is an enormous challenge for our society at this point in time. The last area that I want to talk about that, that, that Brad Meyer raised is, uh, I, I'm going to ask the question, how many of you are considering yourselves to be woke? <laughs> woke. Anybody want to raise their hand if you're woke? <laughs> well, it's, it's uh, it is the lesson presenter's great concept to embrace. Well, the concept of woke, as I understand it, believe me, I have this very light understanding, is a perception that somehow or another, my moral perceptivity and awareness of injustice in society is greater than is the similar attitudes and understandings of other non-woke people. In other words, somehow or another, if you don't understand this lesson today, it's not because I've done a lousy job. It is just that you are not as morally sensitive as I am. And thereby, uh, you know, that, that's why you wouldn't have grasped it fully on it. But this is a very, apparently, a very real reality, particularly in the academic world. And when I say the academic world, I'm, I'm going to say certainly, certainly some of the faculty, but very much so among the younger generation. Uh, this lead has led to some illustrations that are just <coughs> really mind-boggling, I think, that we live, in a sense, in a post-truth concept in many of our leading universities in this country. There was an illustration that I read in the book not long ago, and it really is just almost beyond belief. I think it occurred at Yale. Halloween. Halloween comes along, and so there's a great debate within academia about costumes. Now, we like to think of our academic institutions of levels of high intellectual pursuit for the great meaning of mankind and human God. The moment God is put together out of value. Costumes for Halloween. Well, the, the problem that came up was that certain costumes were perceived by some as to be offensive to other individuals or groups on the campus. One or two of uh, fairly leading academic persons on the faculty were also, I guess, headed up one of the houses that they have up there on the campus. So, well, you know, it, it's a good thing to get together and talk these matters over. Halloween costumes. And so they got together to talk about the Halloween costumes. And uh, the person who was bringing it together made the unfortunate suggestion that perhaps it would be a good idea to exchange views about costumes and whether the school should be endorsing them or not endorsing them. This was perceived to be as highly insensitive 
to certain specific groups in the community. And so, great criticism arose about the individual who called this together that happened to be a lady. To make a relatively unpleasant long story short, there was an unpleasant ending to it. She was forced out of the university. She had to leave. She could not stay any longer. The reactions against both the lady and her husband, who was also a member of the faculty, he lost certain positions in the housing and, and influence that he had on the community because he was not perceived to be adequately sensitive to these issues. Another quick example, in uh, London, England, there was an initial get-together of students. The students decided that the Christian Union could not have a table. They are presenting their documents, what they did, what they believed in, and so forth. Uh, they've been doing it for years, but a group determined and decided that this was insensitive to those students coming into the university who were not a part of Christian traditions, and it said it confirmed the imperialistic attitudes that white Christianity had had for years. This isn't exactly probably the notion that most of us have about what a university should be like, what our students should be like. Two or three other quick items on this. How it has taken its perspective is there is a terminology that is called microaggression. And that is if you come in and talk about an argument, let's say there was one, one illustration, they're going to have a uh, group come in about the rape culture, which in and of itself is probably the most, not the most cheerful kind of thing to be having uh, to get together with, but anyway, they had this document, I mean, had this meeting to share these attitudes and views. The university finally decided, because it was causing so much stress on so many persons, they created a safe room, which individuals could go in and sit. They had, I don't know why, I don't know if I can even believe this. They had coloring books, light reading books, stuffed animals, and so forth, because they found that so many people said that this conversation so deeply upset the individuals, they simply could not cope with it. We also, in this framework, have the no platforming, which is also another a manifestation of where an individual who might come up and say, I'm a very strong uh, believer in a certain social question perspective, the attitude is, we cannot have them come to the university simply because their views do not coincide with the woke understanding of these particular views. These are, I think, difficult and immensely troubling concerns, and they are sort of Rabbi Sack thinks that they are concerns that a society that does not have a strong moral base is going to be influenced by but what can we turn to then on the other side? Let's talk a little bit about morality and religion, which is probably the reason we try to gather together here each week. Our initial founding fathers, and they by and large were fathers uh, in this country, particularly Washington and various others, were of the very, very strong conviction that no government could consider, could continue to exist that was not deeply founded in moral values. He addressed that, I think it may have been part of one of his last speeches while he was still in office. And he stated that it was his belief that even though one might be tempted by the conviction or the thought that this morality could exist outside of a religious structure, that that would be due to failure. That that simply would not work. So two or three general thoughts to share with you here, and then we'll, we'll run through 
not too quick history. First of all, today, as we gather together, uh, Rabbi Sachs makes a couple of observations I think at least are worth you remembering and considering. Religion creates community. Emphasize that again. Religion creates community. Community emerging from religion creates altruistic response. Those steps seem to really be built into place. Second thing he offers is just a, a general view, and then one that came from another is that even though it sounds a little bit strange, the question exists, well, why do we come to church? And uh, what he offers is that there are perhaps two elements that are significant. Belief and belonging. Those two factors are, are perhaps, you know, interestingly enough, increasingly a lot of people who are more objective studiers, if we use that terminology, of the religious experience, began to think now that the belonging may be the most important element of it. When I read that, I, at first part, I kind of ruffled my feathers a little bit, and I thought, well, that's sort of not true. But in thinking about it, I got to sort of analyzing, and I realized that I, I don't know whether you all, when you join a church, you usually, many of us, if you move in for another town, you visit two or three churches. Well, you know, essentially the beliefs of most of those that want me to lend I visit and so forth and that were not greatly different. They were Christian. You know, the value system, the, the belief system itself of what it was affirmed was essentially the same. But the essence of why one chooses to remain, belief brings you in, belonging keeps you. If I could use that terminology, belonging keeps us. And belonging gives us that motivation in the best of circumstances. And I'm getting to self praise, not self praise, but corporate praise here about Harvard Avenue Christian Church. That belonging provides you the information, the awareness, and the ethical and altruistic concern to then step forth into society to implement morality. That, I think, is a pretty significant understanding of where we are. How do we get there, real quickly? This is the only course of the history of humanity in 90 seconds. <laughs> to try to understand how the concept of morality evolved over the course of time to where we are today, uh, it, is, it is really kind of a, a or warped mind like mine, kind of interesting to look back over the course of time and look back beginning into the hunter gatherer groups of people. Uh, some you know, sociologists and politics and so forth have studied these very carefully anymore, and they reached a determination that over the course of time, that those groups could get somewhere 50 to 100 people and it would work all right. That would be the absolute maximum in which they could get along together and the situation would work out. And so they had to fundamentally look after themselves you know, with a little bit of concern for others and, and altruism, uh, took care of their children. Gradually that expanded out. A few people probably got in a raid and wives and children got hauled off to another. Uh, hunter gatherer group, and certain relative, in other words, relations, blood lives, begin to develop here and there. And so group here, A and group B, begin to have small amounts of interchange. And this was in a fairly you know, civilized, what we call civilized man. Uh, that went on for roughly about 99% of human history. Almost all of our human history was dealt with that. We then came in the historical process, as, as it's understood at least by anthropologists today, to the agrarian revolution 
when we moved into raising crops, having people gathering together and not having to hunt for food and so forth, but be able to have a sustainable, reliable source of, of food. And within this framework, you began to get larger groups of people together. And there had to be a way for these larger groups of people to get along without fundamentally arguing, fighting, killing, and so forth all the time. That, that essentially, that was almost the inevitable process. And so, there began to develop a movement away from what was basically spirit worship, basically saying the spirit of the river or the spirit of the winds or whatever influenced my direction, how I believe, so forth, came together to start to create what we would call a more formalized religious structure. We created congregations, or not congregations, not really, but groups of people who gathered together in temples. We created certain gods that were to be worshipped and were acknowledged to be the source of power, understanding, and so forth. And the intent of that and its great achievement was this. It was to give everyone a common base by which they could relate to each other. Just as we all know today, if I walk into a group and happen to remember, be speaking to someone and identify themselves as a member of the disciples, I immediately have a good sense about that. And I, you know, I think I'm going to like these folks. I think we all do that to varying degrees. This was the common bond then that created a situation where you could go ahead and trust people, even though you didn't really know them as you did when you were part of the small group. So this polytheistic assemblage really provided, as I say, a structure of trust, interchange, and permitted societies to grow in a way that without that common bond almost certainly well, this evolved then into the, as time went along, we, we moved into monotheism away from polytheism. And monothe in monotheism, we then turned to the concept of one God, who so had one source to turn to, of which again, all of society could look to as guidance and direction. And then we evolved in even more, uh, perhaps advanced understanding, we began to view this source as a source of justice and a source of love. And a source implying and embedding within our culture the notions that we are somehow made in the image of, in some way, we don't know, I'm reasonably certain the Almighty is not a duplicate of our appearance, but we have uh, somehow are created in the image of the divine. Once we took that step, then you have the basis for what became what we live by today, I would suggest to a great degree, which is the Judeo-Christian ethic. It is an ethic of love, an ethic of justice, a concern for the well-being of the poor. We talk about the other, we talk about taking care of the elderly, visiting the prison. All of these things are a part of the outgrowth of this step when we say, wait a moment, if every person is created in the image of the divine, the ultimate, then they are worthy of our respect, affection, and response. So that's why we got to here. Is there any policy thing we can offer? Because there are lots of concerns. And surprisingly enough, the good rabbi says, yep, there it is. And interestingly enough, I, I have to admit, if I had you told me this before I started reading the book, I probably would have not been too inclined to go along. It is his view that we see signs of this morality throughout society. And the major source of its signs as he perceives it, is the 
religious community, and in particular, the religious community of organized churches. Might be kind of surprised to me that, but here's his viewpoint. We embrace this Judeo-Christian ethic. And so we, we look at society as a whole and what we understand our obligations and responses to that society are grounded in that Judeo-Christian ethic. And so we are therefore reflective of the community that we are, the ones most actively inclined and he, in this case, when I'm making this statement, he's making this statement. Uh, this is not just a feeling of my, how nice it would be for it to be this way. There's been a pretty good amount of analytical work put together where sociologists go out. And what they found is those persons who physically attend church are the most prone toward altruistic giving, they're the most prone to activity within the civil society as a whole, the most prone toward care and concern for a larger group of people. Uh, one of them even made the sort of unique statement that he, he said he could draw this conclusion, which I, I found kind of fascinating, that he said he would make a prediction that a person who identified them as an atheist, but had accompanied their believing wife or husband to church would reflect more altruism and concern for others than a person who identified themselves as a believer but simply stayed home and said, I'm a believer. Well, I suppose it's always a smart thing of a speaker to say, we ain't doing bad. <laughs> This group of people in this church is not doing bad as best I can see it. It seems to me a reflection of the best, not the best, but a reflection of the very good of how we can respond. And that when David talks about inviting other people, encourage the men to become a part of this group here and so forth. I, I, I have to, a profound failure on my board. I always get a little uncomfortable with it. I don't know if you are, but I am you know, like, oh, I'm going to start sounding pietistic and moralistic, and I certainly don't want to risk that, of course. Uh, but what we're saying, if we believe this, and the facts really seem to confirm this that in all of these studies, is we are providing the invitation to be a part of among the most meaningful communities that are available to us. We are inviting people to be a part of a group of people who do, I think, as a whole, have a sense of the moral and who, I think, we probably have a sense that the moral is an essential part of our society and culture and that we are committed to bringing that into play to the best that we can. I think it's a worthwhile way to look at things. To say, yeah, a democratic nation, a liberal democratic nation is a moral achievement. It is a moral achievement, and we have to be thinking of those terms, not fearful of looking like we're being pontificating and self-righteous and so forth, but simply stating a very strong reality, a fact. We have to have that to survive. We have the elements of that, I think, in our church, and at least in closing up, I'm grateful for that. Are there questions, comments, disagreements, or whatever? <laughs> okay. I bet. If you took that 2017 survey that you talked about, where they, they were not very confident in the government, you took it today, it was even lower than that. Could be. Could be. Yeah. We, we are not going through a period where there's 
very confident in our institutions. <coughs> and I, I'm, I'm fortunate, I think that's a fact. Are there other comments or questions? Or, yeah, Mike? But I just want to say, you know, kind of a, you know, at our home, occasionally ask the question, does anybody's kids go to church? And the answer is almost invariably no. And uh, so I think that what's going to happen in the future, the world depends on church attendance. We may be in very serious trouble. I mean, they're good kids, but they just don't have much interest. I, I think part of that, if I, if I can respond to that, is what he suggests here is to understand how critical an element that is. It isn't just a matter of you know, going with a bunch of uh, hypocrites who say one thing and then do the opposite. It is an essential part based upon scientific, or at least reasonably scientific studies of the behavior patterns of people who choose to be a part of the church system and those that don't. Anything else? Oh, Mike. No, I think that the, the topic is so rich, and your presentation to them was so well, that, that we should seriously consider having an extension of it. And I'm not being at all on <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. We appreciate all your efforts. Thank you. I want to give you a kind of a little preview of what we're going to do next week. Lisa Davison was scheduled to be our speaker next week. And as you may remember, her mother is suffering from cancer back in Maryland. So she will not be able to be with us next week. But fortunately, I got an email from Gary Peluso. And everybody knows Gary. And he comes and speaks for us. And and we enjoy having him. Uh, he is going to be, it's going to be a little bit different class next week. He's going to be writing a short book, and his book is going to be about, it's a handbook for Christian congregations to enhance their capacity to talk productively about religion and politics in church. <laughs> This is this should be interesting. I will say this: the leadership team has wrestled with us this last year, and then when we took the survey, we had some in the class who said, "Yes, I want to do that." We had some in the class who said, "Absolutely not, no, I don't want to do that." Gary is a good leader, I think, to lead us through a discussion like this, to give us a chance to listen and to think and to listen to each other to listen to some of the thoughts. He's an organized, bright guy, as you all know. And he really respects this class and our opinions and our thoughts. He thinks it's a very good, bright group of people. And so he's asked me, first of all, he said, could you send out an email to all the challengers and have them send me their thoughts about this? Because he wasn't scheduled to speak for us. Well, we happen to have this blank Sunday all of a sudden, and I said, Gary, would you want to come and talk to us about it? So he wants to, you to think about it this week and some of the questions you might have, some of the thoughts you might have, and I think it could be a very productive time for us to just kind of listen to each other, listen to Gary, see how he flushes all this out for us. It could be healthy. We may not change our opinions. We may still have challengers who say, absolutely not. Challengers who say, oh, yes, let's do it. We may decide in the future to break down the small groups for people that want to do it, have healthy discussion about it. I don't know. But I would invite you, and I will sit down in the chat this next week when Betsy sends it, and when I write it, I will list some thoughts and some questions so that you can be thinking about it before you come to class next Sunday. So with that, again, thank you, Buzz. We really appreciate your time and effort. It takes a lot of work to do that. Thank you. We appreciate it. And we'll see you next week.